Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Portland State University Studio MFA Remote Artist Talk Series. This series is sponsored by the generous contributions from the Wingate Foundation and the DePriest Professorship Fund from the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation. We would like to start this event by acknowledging that Portland State University rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of the Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who have made their homes along the Columbia River. Multnomah is a band of Chinook that lived here in this area. We thank the descendants of these tribes for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since time immemorial. We also acknowledge the systematic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many Indigenous Native American families today. We recognize and honor the collective work of many Native nations, leaders, and families who are demonstrating resilience, resistance, revitalization, healing, and creativity. We thank and honor the original care caretakers of this land and support models and actions of decolonization and reparations by our connected communities. This series brings together artists, curators, and critics from a variety of disciplines to explore the subjects of their work before a live audience. All of our lectures for fall term are being held remotely and live streamed through our PSU YouTube channel. Please make note of our next talk with Adam Kuby that will conclude our artist talk series for the fall. You can view the schedule for our upcoming artist talks on our Instagram page at PSU Studio MFA. At the end of this morning's presentation, we'll be having a Q&A with Christopher and the MFA cohort, and we'll also be fielding questions through a live stream chat. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Christopher K. Ho. Christopher K. Ho, born in Hong Kong, is a speculative artist based in New York, Hong Kong, and Telluride, Colorado. His practice encompasses making, organizing, writing, and teaching. He is known for materially exquisite objects that draw from learned material about and lived encounters with power and otherness in an unevenly decolonized, increasingly networked world. Recent solo shows include Embassy Sites at Tomorrow Maybe in Hong Kong in 2019, Dear John at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in 2019, Aloha to the World at the Don Ho Terrace at the Bronx Museum in 2018, and CX888 at Desart Gallery, Hong Kong in 2018. His multi-component projects have been exhibited at Asia Society Hong Kong, UCCA Beijing, Parasite, the Guangdong Times Museum, the Queen's Museum, Mass Mocha, Storm King, the Ichan Biennial, and the Busan Biennale. He's currently co-editing an anthology for paper monument titled Best Letters from Asian Americans. The New York Times, South China Morning Post, Art Forum, Art Asia Pacific, Yishu, Freeze, Leap, Rondine, Art in America, Modern Painters, Hyperallergic, and Art Review have featured his work. He received his BFA and BSA from Cornell University and his Master's in Philosophy from Columbia University. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Christopher, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, introduction, Darby, and thanks to Ralph Puget and PSU and your cohort for hosting. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and begin my presentation, which will be around 35 minutes. So I'll be sharing with you guys three recent projects, uh, uh, all three of which Darby mentioned in her introduction. And the three projects I've selected concern the theme of reverse diaspora, as well as the possibilities and the parameters of political art in a global context. So, our story begins not with the most recent US election, but rather the last one. 2016 was the year that the thought processes 
for these three projects began. It was the year that one of my art heroes, Andrea Fraser, and I'm, I believe many other people's art heroes, um, Andrea Fraser published the tome we see here, which meticulously traced the connections between art collectors, museums, and US politicians. In part, Fraser was responding to the election of Donald Trump. In that book, in that book that we just saw, she reflects on the surprise result of the 2016 election and notes, quote, the right won the 2016 election because they identified elitism and class power with expertise and education, with cultural capital rather than economic capital. They, the right, mobilized economically precarious whites against cosmopolitan liberals. The left failed to recognize cultural capital as a real form of power that produces real forms of domination. And we'll return to this idea of cultural capital a little bit later on, um, in part because it's so central to artists or cultural producers. But for now, I wanna note my initial reaction to reading Fraser's essay and book, and more generally to the 2016 election. For me, shadowing Fraser's statement is the longtime opposition we have in Western art between the proletariat on the one hand and capitalists on the other. Artists on the left, say Russian constructivists to wage, fall into the former camp with collectors and commercial galleries in the latter. But in 2016, a paramount capitalist ran for the US presidency as a populist, the proletarian's American cousin, and accused the left of elitism. For Trump, the elite included left-leaning academics like Andrea Fraser, entrenched politicians like Hillary Clinton, scientists and institutions like the New York Times and the Washington Post. He, in contrast, was a self-styled radical. So Frazier registered this odd flip from the horizontal axis pre-2016, which is an axis or an opposition between capitalists and proletariat to the vertical or post-2016 axis, where the capitalist becomes the populace and the proletarian becomes the elite. And she registered this astutely. Yet, even as she began in the book we saw and also in her own artwork to ask how artists could respond to this shift in access, her discussion seemed to miss the mark for me. So I intuited that something was missing. The 2016 US election after all, wasn't just about liberals becoming elite whether economic or cultural. It was also about non-whites. So for me, the conversation had to address the intersection between class, race, and ethnicity. And of course, in our most recent election with a biracial vice president elect and also with recent Black Lives Matter protests, this has become all the more apparent and possibly urgent. So years ago, American exceptionalism presented a bridge and a beacon. So my parents, for instance, moved to the US from Hong Kong when I was about four years old because it granted, the US granted freedoms that were in doubt post 1997. 97 was the year that Hong Kong officially reverted back to Chinese rule. And because the US was a decent, moderately taxed place to accumulate capital. But Trump's unwelcoming of immigrants in 2016 and throughout his term foreclosed this option, a foreclosure that continues to resound in violent ways for Asians and Asian Americans in the US with the president and his allies calling COVID the Chinese virus. So instead of the promise of American exceptionalism, the right lurched towards white nationalism and that beget an equally disturbing parallel rise of uh, what the late great Southeast Asian scholar Benedict Anderson called long distance nationalism. And that was a term, long distance nationalism was Anderson's term for 
members of a diaspora feeling, say, more Chinese than American, despite US citizenship and you know, having grown up and raising families in the US. So exploring alternatives to both white nationalism and long distance nationalism became the goal of the first pro project that I'll share with you now, made in 2018 for Dessart Gallery in Hong Kong. So one intriguing solution to nationalism, counter to nationalism, came from the editor Mimi Wong to become a global rather than a national citizen, in a sense to join the transnational elite who see or feel no national boundaries. So here, airplanes and hotels would provide the backdrop for the drama of international life. Which brings me to CX888, a project named after Cathay's Cathay Pacific's recently canceled daily tri-count tri country flight from Hong Kong through Vancouver to New York and back. On the left is an installation view with beach chairs arranged in the 2-2 configuration of Cathay Dragon's regional business class with monitors, the monitors at the front, blinking respectively Cathay Pacific and Cathay Dragon's colors in heroic hexameter, the meter used in the Odyssey, that Greek epic poem about homecoming. And on the right is a model Boeing 777 aircraft in Cathay livery that I bought from the seatback catalog of the Cathay flight that I took to Hong Kong when I was about to make the show CX-888. Elsewhere in the gallery, floor tiles were taken out to form a kind of bird's or plane's eye view of a coastline and fabric in yellow that's redolent of Hong Kong was thrown over studio equipment to give the semblance of say, a country home that has been closed for the season. And on the wall, the small insert uh, photograph on the upper left, uh, on the wall is a fluorescent diagonal line that traces the uh, flight taking off uh, and uh, drawn in color pencils is also E2R or ER2, which is the Royal Cipher for Queen Elizabeth, which before 1997 adorned all the municipal uniforms and buildings in Hong Kong. Some more detail shots on the left, childhood photographs from annual trips to and from Hong Kong with stopovers in Hawaii, and I'll get to that in a second. And on the right, a blank plane ticket that sits in a pool of dried coffee. And these were all part of this CX888 exhibition. So another interlocutor during this time, another editor as it were, Brian Kwan Wood, pointed out that it's also about how you move through the world rather than who you are. Uh, this idea of um, countering nationalisms and transnationalism as a counter to nationalism kind of brings up this, this um, idea of moving through the world. And so mobility with its implications of ethics rather than identity, right? How we interact with others rather than how we self-identify uh, became the guidepost for the second project that I'll share, my 2019 show at the Bronx Museum titled Aloha to the World at the Don Ho Terrace. So this project reproduces a low resolution, uh, in low resolution, the facade of a dismantled hotel on Waikiki, the beach frequented by Don Ho, who was a post-World War II American lounge singer who happens to share my last name. By the way, a very common last name. Um, however, until the 1990s, at least, I would regularly be asked by Caucasians and Americans if uh, I was related to Don Ho. So I was playing off of that. So Hawaii, the home of Don Ho, after whom I renamed the Bronx Museum's terrace on the left image, uh, was of interest because it was the traditional refueling stop between the West Coast of the US and the Far East. And uh, on the right image, the rock speakers, uh, the rocks are actually uh, audio speakers that sat behind the banner 
amidst the theme song from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy played by an arhu or a Chinese violin. And here's a detail of a vitrine that was inside the Bronx Museum featuring among other items, Don Ho memorabilia. So we can say that CX 888 and Aloha to the World at the Don Ho Terrace both foreshadow my own desire to return to Hong Kong after 2016. My own desire to kind of partake in reverse diaspora. CX 888 is the flight and Aloha to the World at the Don Ho Terrace is the midpoint of the journey. And so the idea of returning to Hong Kong called the bluff of go home foreigner, a call that kind of hovers over many hostile encounters in the US, stretching back at least to the, to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, a cartoon of which we see on the left. And more recently, xenophobia and racism against Asians have recurred, stoked by, as mentioned before, Trump labeling COVID-19 the Chinese coronavirus. And a specific institutional example of this uh, is the difficulty that many now have with renewing or receiving H-1B work visas. So to Hong Kong, a city literally caught between two empires in limbo between being a crown colony, being a British crown colony and being part of the Chinese mainland. This odd position between two empires has recently, very recently, been dramatized in the ongoing anti-Beijing protests. And for those who don't know, uh, as I said, in 1997, Britain returned Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China with the codicil that the city have autonomy and an independent judiciary for 50 years until the year 2047. And so the protests are, are, were actually because uh, China kind of jumped the gun. Um, so before 2047, they, they already, they have been uh, starting to undercut freedom of press and the city's autonomy. So just as I had planned on returning to Hong Kong to play out these themes of transnationalism and reverse diaspora, COVID-19, basically left any sort of travel, as we were talking about before this session, nearly impossible. And so we can say that just as I was about to kind of call the US's bluff of go home, the city itself, Hong Kong, was rocked by instability. So these two things, COVID-19, plus the fact that Hong Kong itself was undergoing tons of instability, kind of stopped this idea of transnational travel in its tracks. So where does that leave my work? And this somewhat frictionless, relatively un idea of being a global citizen, which frankly reeks of, of um, elitism and, and privilege. So I think that these kind of recent world events complicates my projects. And I'll end with sharing one more current work that addresses some of these complications and nuances. The work, this third work that I'll share with you is up at Asia Society in Hong Kong right now and it's up through January, 2021. It's a two part installation with on the right, a brass model looking at on the left, a banner featuring the US gymnast, Mary Lou Retton, who won the all around gold at the LA Olympics in 1984. And the model itself, uh, here we see it isolated uh, in pictures on all four sides is designed after Ford's theater where President Lincoln was shot. And it sits on a pedestal reminiscent of a gymnast's vault. And here's a section of the now demolished Ford's theater in Washington DC. And for the curtains, for the kind of cutout curtains on my model, I use traditional formats with, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, really obnoxious names like Empire, Victory, and Squire. Sitting center stage of the model was a miniature table set with a tiny glimmering Thanksgiving turkey. Thought this is appropriate since Thanksgiving is coming up. 
And uh, I should mention also, so here that the installation's title is always stop eating while you're still a little hungry. And that's a quote from John D. Rockefeller Sr. Um, who made his fortune in oil. And I always found this favorite quote or quip of his to be in deep and high contrast to the fortune that he owned. And Rockefeller money also funded Asia society where the work is. Here's a detail of one of the sides of the model. And uh, uh, I don't know, for those who are kind of into, into uh, uh, kind of psychedelic art, you'll realize that the image is actually a magic eye. So if you stare at it, even on your computer screen and cross your eyes using as a guide, the red and yellow swans at the top, a secret image will appear. And I made these magic eyes by combining backgrounds drawn from American spectac spectacles, like in this case, the LA Olympics, but in others, Republican national conventions, 4th of July parades, um, the Balanchine Ballet, Stars and Stripes, and then marches in Colonial Williamsburg. So there is the theater. Um, what about the banner, the second component of this two-part installation. The banner is 432 feet long and it's viewable or visible from where the model theater sits at Asia Society Hong Kong. And it features, again, uh, the US all around gym gymnastics gold winner at the 84 Olympics. And so why you might be asking, am I into 1984 and the LA Olympics? Um, well, the 1984 Olympics was the first that the People's Republic of China on the right and the Republic of China, AKA Taiwan on the left competed together since China's civil war in the 1950s. And so today when we read, you know, about like there are tensions in the Taiwan Straits or the South China Seas. And, you know, we read about China being angry at the US for selling arms or helicopters to Taiwan. It's because technically this civil war hasn't really concluded. 1984 was also the year that Britain signed the treaty with the People's Republic of China to give the colony of Hong Kong, the ex-colony of Hong Kong, my homeland back to China. And so yes, this is a kind of decolonization which is a very popular term today but it's super complicated because Hong Kong wasn't exactly becoming free or entirely decolonized. It was kind of being passed or punted from one empire to another. And so the timing of my project uh, was during the protests in Hong Kong earlier this year. And what fascinated me and what continues to fascinate me in, in future projects is the kind of use of nationalist symbols under the cover of rubrics like peace and unity. So we think of the Olympics being a kind of ceasefire between nation states at war. Um, and as well, I'm interested in the way that one country can kind of take or borrow the symbols of another country as a kind of shorthand. So here at the right of the banner, circled in yellow, Mary Lou Retton opens her hands as she sticks her final winning vault. And this gesture of five fingers was the one that was used, that still is being used by Hong Kong protesters to symbolize five demands. There are five demands from Beijing and also from the pro-Beijing Hong Kong leader, Carrie Lam. You'll also notice in this protest this is in Hong Kong, the central district of Hong Kong, but you'll notice the most prominent flag is actually the US flag. And I cannot describe how odd it was to be both in the US and Hong Kong earlier in January, have this American flag and our president, you know, like make America great again hats, mean totally different things in two different contexts. So on the one hand, here, the failure of democracy and the rise of authoritarianism. And on the other in Hong Kong as a beacon for democracy. And 
I think I'm going to end there with those thoughts, complications, and nuances that I'm still working out and uh, open it up to a uh, discussion. So thank you all very much for, for listening. And uh, I'll pass it back to Darby and Ralph. Thank you so much, Christopher, for your presentation. Um, your work is um, so incredibly nuanced and layered. There's so much to un unpack in all of it. And um, you touched on it briefly, but I was curious um, how the, um, with your history and tr you know transnational approach, um, to life and to art making, how um, being somewhat stationary in this time is affecting the work that you're making right now? Darby, that's a great question. And I, at some, I would love to also turn it back on, on your cohort uh, because it is, uh, it is a strange time uh, for, for everyone. And it, it's, it was a uh, it was strange for me, especially because I, I had actually planned on spending much of 2020 in Hong Kong, um, seriously kind of considering this uh, return uh, to, to live there, um, depending on, on this last presidential uh, election. Um, and, uh, you know, I can get into the, the motivations for returning to Hong Kong. Uh, but I think your question is a good one um, in terms of how that just stopped. Um, I, and I don't really know the answer, uh, the kind of um, unevenness of approaches to the coronavirus worldwide has been startling. And the idea that a virus that sees no national boundaries could reinforce old fashioned ideas of nation states and political geopolitical boundaries was also something that really surprised me. In many ways, um, I felt that before the coronavirus hit, the idea of this kind of Westphalian nation state or, or, or our current ideas of what a nation state is had already been chipped away and were continuing to be chipped away both through globalization, capitalist globalization, um, as well as new technologies. And the fact that a virus has uh, put us back um, to thinking about nation states in a classic Western way is, is disturbing uh, to me. I hope that answers your question. It's a, it's, it's, I'm still working on it. It's, it's a weird feeling to not be on an airplane for so long. And I guess with that, it's like, I feel like when, as you were talking about your work, so much of it is about like, like harboring, well, kind of like embodying your own kind of ambivalence around uh, uh, these experiences, right? So it's like, we're living in like such authoritarian uh, regimes at this moment around the world. And I guess I'm kind of wondering, it's like, how do you navigate that? It's like, um, this current moment is so polarizing. <laughs> um, but it's like to speak uh, from an approach of thinking about decolonization is also having, um, well, part of like your experience of like the way that you define decolonization is somewhat centered on ambivalence. And I, I would love to hear you speak about that a little bit more. It's a great, that's also a really great uh, challenging question, um, Ralph. And I'll try to speak a little bit about it. Excuse me in advance for being uh, garbled uh, because totally. it's, it's going to be like a ton of, uh, it's, it's gonna be tough. I'm gonna basically think aloud. Um, I mean, my sense of, of of classic colonialism, which sets up a binary between the uh, colonizers' city centers and kind of distant lands uh, on the margins, is I, I feel like that is useful, but I also feel like 
for someone, in, I'll just use me as an example, for someone in my subject position um, who is Asian uh, or, and or Asian American or a member of the overseas Chinese community, um, that binary between a uh, uh, metropolis center of the colonizer and the distant land of the colonized world falls apart a little bit, right? Uh, so in my case, Hong Kong is actually very much a metropolitan center. Um, it's hard to call it um, a fringe or on the margins. And secondly, I would argue that Asians and Asian Americans coming to the United States uh, is a kind, it's not quite colonialism, but it's a kind of settling into a new land with the thought of permanent um, uh, kind of uh, with permanence, you know, my, when my parents, for instance, moved to, to the US, uh, they immediately started to try to gain US citizenship. And so it's a very, it's a, it, I think that there are like nuances um, uh, t today, right? And it, it, you know, it's, I wanna say, I, not especially for Asians, but again, using me as a case, I, I think nuances that I have experienced in my lived experience, let's say, or my personal history um, that make this a, a more complicated um, situation. And, and to be honest, Asians coming to the States or Canada or Australia and, and settling, um, it's, I don't know what the term for it is, uh, it, but it is, uh, it is a weird, um, it's a weird example of what used to be considered the colonized margins um, coming to the Western centers and staying and possibly even buying up property and, um, you know, causing resentment, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, at least in this country, I think the resentment against immigrants in part is, is because, uh, of course, driven by a certain amount of fear uh, that um, recent immigrants, often from Asia, are, uh, are encroaching um, and out-capitalizing uh, Western capitalists here. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's really interesting to think about that because there's so much of it that is about like, it, it kind of like, and I'm thinking from my own brain now too, it's like, it makes me think about like, what, how do you define what passive assimilation is versus active assimilation, right? Um, like, what does it mean to sort of like enter into like an empire and try to use the tactics of empire in order to destabilize it versus entering empire in order to sort of like survive. There's like differences between those two things. Um, but I, I oh, um, maybe you can respond to that and then Sophia has a question. Okay, and I definitely wanna hear Sophia's question. I, I think I'm so glad you mentioned empire too because uh, Dar going back to Darby's uh, initial question about um, transnationalism, I, I would say, you know, all of this, all of uh, our conversations are in this backdrop of the economic ascension of mainland China, um, right? And so we aren't really looking at a world where American hegemony is as secure as it was even four years ago. Um, and, you know, I think that when we look at the history of China, mainland China as a country, um, they don't come from a Western idea of nation state. Like they, they actually come from a different model of thinking about, um, uh, well, for us, we would call it a nation, but in a way it, it's, a, it's the model of empire rather than the model of a Western nation state. And so that also, I'm glad you brought, you introduced the term empire because I think that also um, opens up at least for artists or for politicians and whatever. I, it opens up a kind of, some kind of breathing room where we can actually think beyond the nation state. Um, not that I want to revert to empires, but you know, but just looking at other models of, of nationhood, what we call nationhood, um, 
kingdoms, empires, and kind of looking at like other ways we can think about uh, communities. Um, okay, there is a uh, question and I uh, cannot wait to hear it. Um, this is, might be a random question, but um, I was wondering, uh, so after Ronald Reagan uh, visited China, did immigration pick up? That's a really good question. Um, and thank you for, for, uh, for pointing that out. I don't know the exact answer. Um, what I do know is that the first contact between the US and China at the very upper level happened in 1972. And it was President Nixon brokered by Henry Kissinger who was the first president to visit Mao who was still alive barely uh, and Deng Xiaoping and other uh, Politburo leaders in China. And that opened up, at least until the Trump era, um, a, a uh, decades of, of US, because I kind of set the foundation for US-China relationships, I, I would say until 2016 and then whatever, things yeah. change. Now Reagan, uh, I'm sorry, wait, no, no, keep on going. What were no, you gonna no, say? It's just what you're saying makes me think of, like I was looking at uh, when the CIA um, was, uh, watching China. I was reading this document. And, um, and then like after um, there was a shift, uh, Ronald Wh Reagan um, visited and then there was mass immigration, or I guess, I don't know what you're saying, <laughs> but I don't know. I just think there's like, a, there's a relationship between the US um, and the CIA playing a part into, you know, settling. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, for sure, um, absolutely. Um, and uh, it, there was a project that I didn't show called Embassy Sites. Um, and uh, the, the reason I titled it Embassy Sites was one, a joke on Embassy Suites, which is a, like a sub hotel chain of Hilton hotels. Um, but the joke there was that Hilton's used to be de facto embassies where CIA members would gather in places like Hong Kong, where there were only consulates and not embassies. Um, and uh, actually there's a really funny story about the Hong Kong Hilton um, that concerns the CIA. It's because it was such a hotspot for CIA, um, American intelligence in Hong Kong, trying to kind of tap into what's going on in China, that uh, there was a rule that no decor item could be made in China. So they had to go through, take away all of the vases and tables and replace them with American made items. So that's kind of how important, right? The, this intersection of hotels, travel, CIA, and uh, you know, spycraft uh, was. So I think that's a great, so I hope you're making projects about that because that stuff, let me tell you, that stuff is, you can go deep into that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, any other questions? Those are great questions. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I find it fascinating uh, you know, how you touch on uh, identity and then also how we navigate the world. And maybe there's a distinction for you between those two, uh, not quite sure. Um, and then I was, so maybe <laughs> so that, that I guess is a question. And then also um, I, when you think, when you talk about going back to Hong Kong and live in there at this point in your life and career, I was, I, for me, that seems like maybe there's a romantic notion with that, that kind of goes along with that, uh, or maybe some kind of, you know, dream that kind of goes along with that. Um, and I was wondering if you can say a little bit more about that. Thank you. Raja, thank you for um, an incredible question and also a even more in, in, insightful uh, observation. You are absolutely right that there is so much romance to going back to Hong Kong, which is uh, you know, why there are childhood photos in this, in this exhibition um, uh, you know, about uh, uh, going back to Hong Kong. And, um, of course, the reality of it uh, will be very different than the romantic version of it. And uh, 
I have no defense, right, for this. I, I acknowledge uh, your, your, I'm acknowledging your point that that romance of the homeland is possibly as dangerous as any kind of nationalist impulse, um, you know, on, on, a, on a U.S. citizen, on, on, let's say, me as a U.S. citizen. Um, it's something I'm thankful that you pointed out and something that I uh, need to be uh, wary and aware of. Um, so thank you for that. In terms of the dis distinction between uh, identity and say, moving through the world, um, when I started this set of projects, uh, identity politics, which you know, for someone like maybe Ralph, certainly for someone in my age, we remember, we remember the 1990s, okay, <laughs> when, when identity politics really was uh, discursively formed in the art world. Um, and so it was super interesting to see uh, contemporary and possibly younger artists kind of take on uh, explorations of identity in the past four or five years. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the hesitations um, I had with it was uh, I, I was more interested in how people interact with other people um, more than kind of how they, they self-identify. And so um, all of a sudden, uh, if you think about, as the editor Brian Kwan Wood had suggested to me during this really incredible conversation that we had, uh, it, you know, if you think about moving through the world, which has very much to do with diaspora. I feel like, you know, the double consciousness of any immigrant or member of the diaspora, right? If you think about moving through the world, inevitably you have to think about ethics as well as identity. And so that ethical component, how we interact with other people, how we treat other people, that to me seemed to be the, the uh, partially missing from um, a focus on, on self-identification. Uh, I had a, a question regarding the, because a lot of your work has some sort of like contemporary technology or like contemporary life, which is just kind of backed by technology elements. And then kind of if you see that shifting with the changes that are happening with COVID, like that we're kind of moving towards a, um, or I guess, well, and then there are all these physical objects and now we're moving to this kind of non um, physically reliant world with like zoom meetings and stuff. Like there was just the other day, a quote from Bill Gates was like that the in-person meeting isn't the gold standard. And he thinks business travel is going to drop by 50% like permanently. And, um, and I, I worked front desk at a hotel for a few years and that was, you know, a ton of business travel. And so like that going away and that shift. And then do you still, do you think maybe your work will follow suit to that? Or do you, is that physical object still really important? Or I don't know if you've just thoughts kind of on that shift or trajectory. Um, these are great questions, you guys. I, I, I Alex, an uh, another uh, incredible question. And uh, first of all, before I even get there, um, what, could you name the hotel that you worked at or the chain that you worked at? Just oh yeah, I, uh, I worked front desk at the Ace Hotel here for Got it. like three and a half years, a okay. while. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm part, I'm kind of obsessed with hotels. Uh, so I, I'm just, okay. Oh yeah, one that day, was an interesting one to be at. Very, yeah. uh, very specific in its people. <laughs> Um, well, one day we have to die. I, I, I would be curious to hear more. Now, oh, yeah, your question about um, technology, I think that is a very astute one. I appreciated the question. I'm not sure if I would have brought it to the virtual or the digital, though. I actually feel like it's going the opposite direction, which is to say, especially for art makers, for makers, um, I actually feel like aesthetically what we're going to see moving forward is far more of a focus on modest and handmade and a little bit wonky. Now we've definitely seen this already, right? In the, in the 
mid 2000s, 2008 Whitney Biennial being like the kind of apex of this kind of wonky aesthetic. Um, you know, I, I feel like we're going to see less polish and more, um, for lack of a better term, personality in, in, in work. Um, the piece that I'm working on, on now, you know, when I flipped my computer b before we started, uh, you know, it's based on photo, uh, it's based on eight and a half by 11 printouts and tape, right? And, you know, there's, a, there's this amazing article that came out um, uh, um, a year and a half ago about say, it, it, that the title was something like, after COVID, you start world building with a roll of tape. And the author was talking about how tape now marks off parking lots in, at Walmart, uh, you know, that you, every other parking lot. Uh, tape marks out where you're supposed to stand, so you're six feet apart from each other. And, and, you know, that kind of aesthetic of just a roll of tape and eight and a half by 11 paper, what's around you, right? Um, I think actually is going to, to determine our, the make our, our meaning the art world's aesthetic sensibilities going forward. I'll also say this, because of contemporary art daily, you know, there's been such a, a, a sense of like that slightly overexposed, crisp documentation of artwork. I also think that's going to go away, right? That has to do with moving art into a studio, hiring a professional photographer. For, I, I, I think we're gonna start seeing artwork documented in, you know, I see behind Darby bookshelves, Alex behind you, I see an artwork in a lamp. That's gonna be the context. That, that we're going to actually start seeing documentation of art. And so I think um, embracing and in a way like interrogating to use like a totally cliche art world word, uh, you know, that aesthetic sensibility, I think would, will be a very rich um, arena, you know, moving forward. Uh, super interesting, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Julia. Or, uh... Thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I had to write down my question because I think it's going to be a little bit confusing if I don't go by that. But I feel like the idea of Global Citizen is so a lot more to not like non-white Americans and non-European people. And sometimes they feel like that's done to erase the knowledge that is being created in these other spaces. How do you feel about that? Do you see that or haven't you experienced that? Um, another fantastic question. Uh, one quick uh, uh, clarification. So when you say um, uh, the use of global citizen by, by non, Europeans um, and the kind of erasure of knowledge. Do you mean the knowledge that the Anglo-American European world has, has gathered or accumulated? Um, yes, there's this movement, uh, especially in Latin America that it's called the coloniality of knowledge and power. And a lot of the times when we're trying to fight um, colonized ideas and perceptions of knowledge um, we're so this idea like, oh no, but now everyone is a global citizen, um, but I don't see anyone going to like a French person and be like, hey, uh, ignore your culture, ignore your knowledge, like <laughs> global citizen. So that's kind of <laughs> I mean, but shouldn't we be doing that? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> um, that's really interesting. I mean, the really obnoxious answer, which I'm just gonna verbalize, whatever, um, is in some sense, our Anglo-American European um, uh, colleagues um, <laughs> or that world um, is quite provincial when we think about 
the globe. I mean, that's an obnoxious answer. Okay, uh, so let's let's unpack it a little bit. Um, You're cracking me okay. up. Um, okay, here's a here's a better answer. It's not. It's like barely better, but I'm going to verbalize anyway. Um, for our Anglo-American European world, for that world, uh, globalization meant probably colonialization. So it was a specific approach to the world that viewed the world in specific hierarchical terms. I would like to hope that when a Latin American or an Asian um, or a Southeast Asian, South Asian uses the term global citizen, um, it is uh, not under the rubric of the hierarchies of uh, our, our colonial um, century. Uh, it's a slightly better, wait, what do you think? I, I wanna hear your thoughts on this. Um, that it's hard to get around. I don't know if I have specific thoughts. I think that to me, it's really hard especially now being at an American school, like I didn't live there ever. And like, I'm still in Brazil. So it's really difficult. Like it's hard not to get upset. A lot of the times I find myself really, really angry. Um, it's hard to have different references and it's hard to try to match those without erasing one or the other. Cause I don't think like we should ignore like European knowledge, but it's like adding to it, you know, just not making just this one narrative. So it's hard because like there's so much of my emotions there that I can't even like be completely rational to it because I'm experiencing it firsthand. That's really interesting. And I, I here, I, I unsolicited uh, suggestion. I wonder, Julia, if you can't embrace those, that emotional reaction. One of, just to go back to, I think uh, a question that Raja had about, um, you know, ethics and, and interaction of people. I, another thing that we can do, especially for artists who are dealing with political art is to pay attention to our emotions because those are what actually kind of round out what ends up being like really abstract polemics, you know, that don't really help anyone because absolutely what you're saying is true. You erase another, you just end up erasing another narrative um, because you're kind of being an advocate, right? For, for what you, you know, whatever this alternative or marginalized or whatever. I, so I don't know, I think like complexity of emotions is kind of like complexity of interacting with someone else. Like all of a sudden it's not just self-identity. It's not just pure politics with a capital B. It gets super nuanced and complicated. And so both of those roots seem um, like worthy ones. Have no idea how that's gonna appear in your art. You know, like, uh, of course that's like easy to say, but like then someone you have to, yeah. in your studio, how do you do that? Uh, who knows? But it's a challenge. Okay, thank you so much. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Melanie, you have a question? It's tying back a little bit to your conversation with Alex about um, the switch to documenting work in a sort of like unpolished way. I was just curious if you've already started attempting doing that with your own work. <laughs> Melanie, I'm, um, I'm too old. I, I like, and I, I'm, I'm actually totally serious. It's too lit for me. I have like, I have been raised on the clean photograph. So even if I do a site specific work, I actually decontextualize the work to document it because that's like how I was taught to do this. It's like too late for me. This is, it's, it's some aesthetic, um, Trend, not trends, but some aesthetic uh, motifs are, I, 
it's it's just they're gonna come and go and 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 like that whatever <laughs> but i think you should i'm cute i'm interested in seeing that in in other people's uh work um uh, andrea okay. or andrea either one <laughs> um since you explore themes of nationalism, power structures, politics, and authority, um, have you ever had challenges exhibiting your work or what has the response generally been? Um, and have any responses and dialogues ever surprised you? That's a really good question. Um, so I've only had two instances uh, where, um, uh, I, I've encountered uh, challenges and admittedly they were fairly light. Um, so the first one is actually the last project that I showed you uh, at Asia Society. Um, it's a very, very sensitive time in Hong Kong. And so uh, I wanted to do something that addressed the protests, which the art world in Hong Kong is incredibly invested in, um, I, I'm very, very politically aware and invested in. And I had to do it indirectly. So uh, through introducing themes of America, Americana, which I knew would be read a particular way in Hong Kong as a pro-democracy statement. Um, but Asia Society is government funded and with actually, to be blunt, a very conservative chairman. So I, I knew I had to be slipped in there. And certainly, um, the five-fingered uh, symbol, uh, you know, absolutely, it, it had to be uh, something that was that that was couched in, you know, in this case, a, a gymnast um, uh, a gesture, um, and I, 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 because it just it wouldn't have it just wouldn't have happened um, uh, if if it hadn't been. The second instance is uh, at, at a museum in, in China. Um, uh, actually, it was the work CX888, which was about reverse diaspora and so forth. Um, you know, to, it was very interesting. Uh, what happened was the, there were five curators of an exhibition and each of the curators kind of took care of about four or to five artists each. So the curator who took care of me wrote two set press releases. Uh, one was the press release for the art world and description, artwork description uh, for our peers. And then for the government overseer um, wrote another one um, where CX888 was about um, missing home and, and the love for, of, of China and, and I, you know, and like the thing is like, both of these are valid, right? Sure, I, I can also see that project being, I miss home and I wanna, you know, there are other things that the project brings up. Um, so uh, that, those are the two instances that I've, I've encountered. That's a great question though. Thank you and thank you for your presentation. Um, I, Raja raised her hand, but I also have a question, um, but maybe Raja should go first. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to follow uh, from what Andrea was saying. Um, how, how much um, do you consider uh, legibility in your work? Um, so do you feel like the work needs to be legible? Um, and then considering that it's usually presented in these different countries and different, with different groups, but do you feel like it's basically um, it needs to be legible on its own and all these ideas and all this research that you shared with us today that needs to basically be communicated just through the, the work itself directly how do you um i guess approach that thank you uh raja that's a, a also another uh fantastic uh question from you i'm gonna explain how i view things uh which is not to say how i think every artist should approach their work. So the way I approach work is I, and I, by the way, I also realize that this is, there are many problems with this, but I feel like work should be watertight. Um, no holes, no gaps, everything should be thought through. 
Um, and the person I have in mind as my ideal audience member is a future researcher who will look carefully into every single step of the way. Now, that does not mean I expect a viewer, an, a, a typical audience member to re do that work, that that is not the demand I put on the viewer. Um, however, it's the demand I put on the work uh, to, to have that kind of uh, closed, uh, well thought out, um, those edges that are well thought out. Um, and then uh, again, not, I don't think every artist should approach their work this way, but my position is that if I do that work and make the, the artwork have such uh, uh, standards, then whatever a passerby audience member sees will be good enough. And then if you look deeper, it also, you know, it, it's, it's hopefully also good enough. Um, so, but I think there are so many different approaches uh, that that's, that is just the way I've, I, 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 I operate. And in terms of this future audience, how far into the future are you like imagining this future audience to be? Oh, Ralph. Let's hope it comes soon. <laughs> I, let's hope it comes in my lifetime, but probably not. Let's face it. <laughs> um, Andrea has a question. Uh, following up on these other questions, um, how do you determine how deeply you couch messages in each of your pieces? If that makes sense. It does. Um, and uh, to, to respond to that, uh, I'll give you uh, an example of how I work. Um, when I begin a project, um, I have a blank wall in front of me. And every idea, no matter how half-baked, gets its own eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with the name of that idea pinned up on that wall in a column. And as I progress this early stage before production, right before actually material ex experimentation, still thinking about it, I begin to fill out each of those columns going downwards. Um, and essentially the columns that are the longest are the ones that stay. They end up being the kind of scaffold uh, for the project and the, you know, some columns never make it past the first eight and a half by 11 page. Uh, some make it three down. So the shorter ones end up being slipped in to the longer columns, the stronger ideas in super subtle ways. So it may end up, I'm trying to think of an example. Here's an example. In the last project I showed you, you know, um, uh, the Balanchine Ballet Stars and Stripes, which is a, a, a wonderful ballet that George Balanchine choreographed and, and you know, had to, to the tune of the Stars and Stripes, right, uh, to our um, national anthem. Um, you know, that actually started out as a, a, a main idea. Um, it just never went very far. You know, I watched this ballet, I, I did research into the specific principal dancers, the actions, I could have gone into a kind of performative choreographed, I think, project somewhere. Uh, but it, in this case, it didn't go very far. And so it ended up just being a background for a magic eye. Uh, you know, this kind of optical illusion on one of the sides. And that was because it was a kind of minor idea um, that didn't have legs. So I think that hopefully embedded are multiple ideas on many levels. And again, this is all with a codicil that I just told Raja, this is not how I think every artist uh, should work. Um, I, I think you all as, as MFA students, um, I do think that everyone should work out and be able to articulate how they work, uh, not specifically this way. Um, but I do hope that, you know, everyone like in your three years is kind of like, Oh yeah, this is how I start projects. This is what a, the medium middle of a project feels like. You know, this is what material exploration feels like for me. Um, so that you can, so that you know, 
uh, moving forward, right? Like you kind of, you can get a sense of how far along a project is because of your previous experience. But that's a great question. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. I just had a quick comment. I was going to say, it's one of the things I really enjoyed with your work was the, um, every object in the pieces always feels like very purposeful and very explained and like very intertwined, but, um, but it never feels heavy handed in the explanation of everything. Like everything feels very thoughtful, but never like this, that, this, that, like, I'm trying to think of the word. It's like a curse of grad school. It's like A plus B plus C, like plus D, and then like get to your final answer. And it never feels like it just, yeah. I, it's the thing I really enjoyed looking at your work. Thank you, Alex. You know that your director is on this on this Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> he let, knows. Should, it's fine. I, he knows I'm about me. I'm aware of the formulaity of grad school and like how it, it can be like a safety tool for a lot of students. Um, I mean, we've all gone through it, right? Um, thinking about, oh, like, what, what is the right formula to, like, make this work? But I, I guess it's like, I want to turn that into a question. How, what are, like, your measures in terms of, like, trying to make sure that it's, like, the work does not feel that way, right? Because it's, like, I mean, you're, like, creating your own logics and, like, yeah, there are ways that it does feel like really polished, but then there are also like ways this like it's very fluid and organic and you're just allowing the internal logic of it to sort of like spread out and like form it's on its own. How do you navigate that? I mean, it's probably time. I mean, but listen, it's not just a, fun it's a function of maybe the pedagogy of grad school, Alex, what you're saying, but it's also, let's face it, a matter of time. I mean, you, you have other classes to go to, you, you know, you have a crit in three weeks. I mean, clearly ideas are going to be um, blunter, let's say, uh, because you have three weeks, right? And, and, and then someone comes in and of course they're critiquing your work as if you had three years to work on the thing. On average, I take two and a half years to, to produce a project. And, you know, at the end of two and a half years, even, we as people have, have changed, much less our work, right? So um, after two and a half years, inevitably there is, um, there is a, I, I, I would like to think that inevitably there is depth to the work because you've just progressed it for so long. Um, it's to, I, I listen, I've taught grad students also and I, it is not an, let, let's face it, it's like not a, normal context for art making. And it's, uh, you know, like, we just have to take that with a great, uh, yeah, fine, you know, you, that's how it is. And yeah, it's gonna be kind of blunt half-baked projects, which is, which is cool also. <laughs> I, um, I wanna, uh, oh, go ahead, Alex. I, just, I, had a, I had a real quick thing on that timing and the like two and a half years roughly kind of span I had noticed you had a couple pieces like the most recently was like the Imperial ruler stand was presented at least on your website as its own individual piece, but then was later a part of that total, um, the blobfish installation. And then I believe it also happened with the, the one that was the John Podesta bed. And then that was in the larger embassy suites installation one. Okay. This is amazing. Alex, you have literally just mentioned the two projects that I am least proud of. So no, it's, it's super interesting, which means that you can actually, you can detect that, uh, you know, you're able to somehow through the work, you, you can actually detect that these were honestly really rushed. Um, I, I, like to be totally blunt, the, the Blobfish project in, which was in Guangdong Times Museum, I, I think I had, um, four months to do it because I had this Brooklyn Academy of Music thing that, that like preceded. And I, who can work on three projects at another grad school thing where you have to work on three projects at once, right? But like tip, like in real life, you, you really can't work on more than one project it's at the same time. So, you know, it's so, fa that's fascinating. And at embassy sites, you know, here I arrive in Hong Kong, you know, at this kind of residency uh, for a month. And, you know, it's like, 
you know, you, you produce a show and, you know, I'm in a strange context. I don't have fabricators, I don't, whatever. So it's, it's actually amazing. Um, yeah, not happy with those. Would definitely, would definitely spend another year on both of them, but fine. It's whatever. That's also fine. <laughs> I mean, making bad work is part of making work. So yeah, it's in the course. <laughs> I, I kind of want to like ask a question that maybe like detracts from like that a little bit and like move back to thinking about politics and thinking about politics in relation to art. So it's like in, in a case, it's like you, you kind of like started your presentation with thinking about Andrea Fraser, right? And thinking about maybe institutional critique, um, but also thinking about like how that goes in line with identity politics. Um, and kind of like forming more elaborate idea, like understandings of like what identity politic work could be. Um, I guess I'm just thinking about this current moment in which uh, we, we, we live in an information age where we, there's like critique of politics all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And identity is like mentioned in the media all the time, right? And I guess I'm kind of wondering being, a, a, as you are as an artist, being a future thinker and thinking about like a future audience, I, I'm kind of wondering if you have any insight as to like what, like how identity politics or like not identity politics, but maybe more institutional critique as a function of art would function in the future, given how unstable institutional critique is at, at this current moment in time. That's a great question. Um... And uh, I'll split it into two, one with a very short answer and one with a longer answer. The short answer addresses the half of the question that deals with identity. And going back to Raja's question, I would say elaborating identity to include ethics would be the short answer to that moving forward. Now, institutional critique is a slightly longer answer because it has a slightly longer history from the 1970s onward. I would say the first faltering of institutional critique as a field happened in around 2008 with the Great Recession. That was when institutions, including the almost too big to fail ones, um, to go back to our very early uh, conversation, um, they actually began to fail. So in 2008, I think the inkling from institutional critical artists were how odd is it to be criticizing institutions like museums, major museums, when frankly they were going bankrupt and some ended up closing. It was a very um, mean-spirited thing to do uh, as well as uh, almost um, just performative, right? I mean, the things were going down anyway. So, you know, why spend time critiquing them? Um, now, I think that um, moving forward from 2008, I'm really interested in artists institution building rather than institution critiquing. So, you know, after decades, honestly, from 1970s to 2008, we're talking decades of criticizing institutions. Um, I think there need, there still needs to be a turn to a synthetic uh, generative model of art making and how art making intersects with institutions. And I think that since 2008, that has happened somewhat, right? It's happened with artists run schools, for instance. Um, uh, it, it's happened with some nonprofits uh, and, and actually more interestingly, a lot of artists are starting for profits, um, you know, which is actually almost more of an institution build than starting yet another nonprofit. Um, yeah. So I think the future of institutional critique is turning our lessons uh, of the past few decades into generative synthetic projects. Mm. Um, I guess to follow up with that, it's like, can you define synthetic in this realm? Like, um, like are you talking about hybridity in terms of like incorporating conflicts? Um, no, but that, I, actually, I, I, that's already more sophisticated than how, how I was thinking about it. I was thinking synthetic um, more in terms of building up rather than uh, tearing down. But actually, Ralph, you know, I think that your, your definition of the term synthetic is, is far 
well, first of all, it's more correct than mine, like uh, from a definition standpoint, but it's also like far, far richer. And I would say as a corollary to institution building, you know, artists have all traditionally in the West thought of themselves as on the margins and um, in a way, a form of protest or a form of being uh, revolutionary or punkish and whatnot. But I think, you know, that if we can, if some artists can think of themselves as, as mentors and as leaders rather than as um, on the margins, uh, you know, even if it's a thought exercise, right? Even if you're not at the center and, and, and you know, if you're not, even if you're not empowered and, and so forth, just to mentally go there. Um, I think that would be, uh, that would also follow this idea from institutional critique to institution building from a kind of punkish revolutionary bohemian to a mentor or a leader. Um, so those are the shifts that I'm most interested in seeing in our field. Yeah, I agree. I, it seems really interesting to think about that right now and like claiming ownership over like being your own active agent and experimenting with that, giving your positionality seems like the right thing to do or not the right thing, but it just seems like it, it feels very responsive. Um, are there any other last questions for Christopher? Christopher, it's been so fun and wonderful and insightful to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for presenting on your work and asking all of our questions. Um, we hope that you had a great time uh, interacting with us and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you guys all. Thanks so much for amazing questions. Um, so keep me up to date with your work and uh, I thank you so much, Ralph, and thank you so much, PSU. You guys are great. Really enjoyed those questions. So thank you, all of them. You're great. Have a great weekend. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you.